Let's open our Bibles once again to the book of Ezra and chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3. We got through the first seven verses uh, last time. So let's try to move ahead here in chapter 3. And let's read verses 8 through 11. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sung together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. This joyful scene takes place as Jews, uh, young and old, middle-aged and and uh, aged, I suppose, uh, celebrate the laying of the foundation in the second temple. And we talked last time about the rebuilding of the temple initiated uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, and uh, also that being a likely date for the glorious, visible return of Christ at the end of the tribulation. Um, and I hope it wasn't as clear as mud last week. Hopefully there was something there you could say, I can, I can understand that. But I'd like you to turn back to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. In the text we just read, it says in verse 8, Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel and so forth and so on. But, uh, and then by the time we get down to verse 11, they praise the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Well, all of that takes some time to achieve and accomplish. But uh, 1 Kings 8, and let's read... Verse uh, 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. This is Solomon praying. Verse 29, That thine eyes may be opened toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. And also verses 41 and 42. Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy namesake, for they shall hear of thy great name, and of thy strong hand, and of thy stretched out arm, when he shall come and pray toward this house, and so forth. That seems to match what Isaiah says in Isaiah 2, verse 3, and you needn't turn. Uh, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion 
shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And also Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, there's no hard and fast uh, declaration in the scriptures, and the verses don't precisely say so, but it's highly likely that Solomon, since a house is a structure of sorts to contain someone in or for someone to dwell in, it's highly likely and uh, perhaps probable that Solomon's dedication took place at the same time of the year as this dedication under the leading of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, go forward to the book of Nehemiah, the next book in the Bible after Ezra. Nehemiah 7. Nehemiah 7. And as they're finished and as they're com completed, verse uh, 73. So the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and the Nethanims and all Israel dwelt in their cities, and when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. And chapter 8, verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Uh, the seventh month of the Jews' calendar uh, is the month in which the Feast of Tabernacles occurred. And uh, we say... The seventh month in the old world calendar, our old calendar, was the month of September. And I think I mentioned to you last time, uh, the name September means number seven, or the seventh. September, October, November, December still means seven, eight, nine, ten. Those used to be the numbers of the months when we used to start, when they used to count the year beginning around March. But uh, they moved it back, and I forget when, and I didn't research that, to January as the beginning of a new year. So that December is now the 12th month, and September, I think, the 9th month. But the names uh, still mean 7, 8, 9, 10 for the last four months on our calendar. And so sometimes when we're talking about the 7th month of the Jews' calendar, we'll refer to it as September, just sort of to... Uh, um, uh, be consistent in, in generalizing it. But um, by the way, in the month of, or the seventh month, when they, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, for seven days they would, they would make a booth or a, a little lean-to out of branches and uh, wood or boards, they could find them, a temporary structure, and they would sleep outdoors for seven nights uh, recalling the, as a w way of recalling for themselves their journeying through the wilderness for 40 years when they had no permanent dwellings. They're all temporary dwellings. And uh, this is how the Feast of Tabernacles was also observed for the Jews. And um, isn't it interesting, uh, someone pointed out to me years ago, I never thought about it, but during the month of September, that's usually when a lot of people have county fairs, a lot of county fairs throughout the country, and uh, the vendors are in temporary structures. They're dwelling in booths, much as the Jews were told to dwell in uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, of course, they refer to this as a tabernacle more often than they do a booth, but uh, both words are found in the scriptures. Anyway, uh, it's highly likely that Solomon's dedication occurred at the same time of the year as this one uh, under Ezra and Nehemiah, coinciding with the Feast of Tabernacles, or at least the month in which it occurred. Uh, God destroyed... Um, well, I'd rather be back up. That's why we said something about the, the second advent, or the second coming of Christ, uh, coinciding with the Feast of Tabernacles, when God would once again come and make his dwelling among men. Um, that the second advent of Christ would come at that time of the year uh, as well. But God destroyed this world 
twice in the past, as if you understand the scriptures the way I've been led to understand them and believe them. Uh, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. There was a pre-Adamic flood. If you take the, the similarities between Adam and Noah and line them all up together, each man was the father of the world in his day, respectively. Each man had three sons uh, whose names are given. They may have had more children than that, but at least three sons whose names are given. Uh, each one had one son who was a type of Christ, uh, Abel and Shem. And each one had one son who was a type of the Antichrist, Cain and Ham, in Noah's case. Uh, each one was uh, naked in connection with his sin. Uh, Adam was naked when they ate of the forbidden uh, tree in the garden, and uh, Noah was uncovered in his tent when he drank of the uh, wine. Uh, in each man's case, they had the animals brought to them. At, uh, the animals came to Adam, and he named them, and they all came to Noah and got on board the ark without him having to go catch them. And uh, a number of other similarities, but uh, that's enough to... And each man, in, in, uh, in Genesis 9, God said to Noah, after the flood was over, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Obviously, that means to refill it or repopulate it. And in Genesis chapter 1, God said to Adam, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So, uh, and each man's commission, as it were, given to him, to replenish the earth and be fruitful and multiply. Each man's commission given to him after the world was said to be covered with water. Darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, Genesis 1 says, and likewise the flood of Noah occurred uh, before God told him to replenish the earth and be fruitful and multiply once again. So that was the first uh, destruction of the world. And then, of course, the second destruction was uh, under Noah. The flood of Noah, Genesis 6, 7, and 8. And uh, he told, uh, he tells us that he will destroy it a third time. Uh, let's go to Second Peter, chapter 3. I'm going by a circuitous route to get to my point, but bear with me. 2 Peter 3, and uh, let's start there at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And also, uh, real quickly, Revelation 20. Revelation 20. And uh, one verse there, verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So God destroyed the world twice, and uh, has said that he will destroy it a third time in the future. In a similar way, uh, there have been at least two destructions of the temple. In the past, there was uh, in 589 BC the first temple of Solomon's destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and then in 70 AD the second temple, although it was 
built and added on to and built and, and so forth over many years, uh, destroyed by Titus and the Roman army uh, in 70 AD. There will need to be a third temple uh, destroyed before Jesus Christ comes and reigns uh, on the earth in his kingdom. There is a temple rebuilt. You hear it all the time in the news, and you'll pick up some um, Christian prophecy newsletter. Is the temple about to be rebuilt? The temple about to be... But that temple is going to be built for the Antichrist to come in and desecrate it and set himself in there and demand that men worship him. And it'll be desecrated and destroyed under him. Uh, that temple, is, and there's a reference to that, and we won't turn to it. It's in Revelation 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. That temple is mentioned during the tribulation. But uh, that is not the same as Ezekiel's temple, Ezekiel chapters 40 through about 48. Um, the details of that one given. That's not the same as the millennial temple in Ezekiel. So there will need to be a third temple yet to be built, which will then be destroyed uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ has one built to his own liking according to the scripture's uh, uh, directions. Let's, let's go to verses 12 and 13 of Ezra 3 tonight. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. These ancient men uh, were old enough to have seen the Solomon's temple in their youth. And they weep, be, before the, of course, before the Babylonians burned it and then took uh, the kingdom of Judah cap into captivity. But they couldn't help but weep when they compared the inferior quality of this new temple to that of Solomon's. Younger people shouted because they had a temple. They, didn't, they had never seen the first temple. But these old men had seen the first one and remembered its magnificence and were weeping because this one was nothing like that first one. As, as much of a blessing as it was, as wonderful as it was, for them to be returned back to their land and given authority to rebuild, it was not like the first one. And things... It, it's amazing how something that worked well and was extremely efficient and uh, got the job done better than anything uh, else could have, always needs to be improved upon by the next generation. And the next generation usually makes it worse than the first one was. Over there, across the street from my employment, is a big church. They run about 1,500 people on Sunday mornings. That church has been there for... Oh, at least 140 years. And uh, they were known as the First Baptist Church, and I won't give the city, uh, for all of that time. And this pastor, who's been there for 20 years, uh, and riding the coattails of past uh, ministers in the past, who built the church up, and the older church members who donated financially to build it, into such a very large enterprise there in town, this new pastor came in and decided he wanted to contemporize everything. And we can't be called Baptist Church. That throws people off. And so um, it's simply called Purpose Church. Well, I've given the name of it. Now anybody can look it up on the Internet now. But Purpose Church. not And, and even that... Uh, incomplete English phrasing grinds on me. Um, it's not the purpose church or the church with a purpose. It's simply purpose church. There's no um, 
article in front of the name. And they replaced the lettering on the front of the building. It no longer says First Baptist Church. It's just got purpose, church, purpose in bold letters and church in regular font letters. I have no idea what's going through the mind of that minister. But there was one humorous um, bit uh, in the development of that over the last few years. A humor writer for a local paper covered that name change. And he talked about the church having been named a First Baptist Church for the last 130 years. And he did say, I doubt if Purpose Church will remain for, the, for another 100 years. It won't. And um, what I'd really like to really, what would really be wonderful is if one day when that minister uh, feels God moving him on, uh, to somewhere else or some other uh, endeavor, a new pastor comes along and says, we need to let people know where we stand. Let's go back to the Baptist name. <laughs> that, would be, that would be wonderful. Although I, I'm not going to hold, hold my breath for that, but it certainly would be a nice uh, turn of events. All the older folks who contributed money over the decades to build that church up were soul-winning people and they were uh, Bible-reading people None of that anymore. Uh, they go there. It's funny, these churches that want to uh, contemporize a traditional church, they always relegate the older church members, the ones who liked what was going on, the ones who built that church up and financially uh, supported it, they always relegate them to the 8 o'clock or 8.30 in the morning church service, our traditional service. And then the younger people who who are healthy enough, they could get up earlier, they get the 10 o'clock service. When yet, and, yet, and yet they're more physically able to get up earlier and show up at 8.30, but Starbucks doesn't open maybe in time for them to get their coffee and walk into church with it. But things, things generally tend to decay. They generally tend to deteriorate. They corrode. They implode. They fall apart, they break apart, and uh, what was working well, uh, the idea that you can't just leave it alone and leave it as it is. Every time they update a new, they have a new version of the Bible that comes out, they think they're making things better. Bible, uh, Christianity, Christians, are the laughing stock of Muslims, at least Muslims who are active and trying to promote their religion, because they say, you Christians, you have like a hundred different versions of the Bible, and none of you agree on any one of them. And they have a valid point. I only have one. Well, you and I only have one, but uh, you know what I mean. Yeah. And they have a valid point. Uh, every time another version of the Bible is launched onto the market, it just brings down the image of Christians uh, a little bit further until uh, it doesn't read like the Bible. It doesn't sound like the Bible. It doesn't say what the Bible used to say. Uh, and a change here and a change there. And then another change over here. And then a fourth change over there and another change here. Pretty soon you've got an entirely new Bible. And that is what the modern generation of Christ so-called Christians are reading and uh, being fed and taught, and none of it has any ring of authority to it. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Ecclesiastes 8, verse 4. And there's something about the, the cadence and the rhythm and the tempo and the poetry of the King James language that makes it easy to remember, easy to quote, and easy to cross-reference with other verses that is uh, destroyed. Once you start changing a word in the Bible, then you've destroyed the cross-reference system where you would compare this verse over here with that verse over there. Once you change a word in that verse, the cross-reference between the verses is uh, destroyed as well. And so everyone thinks they're improving it, but they're not improving it. Uh, you and I live in a, a time when, over the last century, uh, over 100 versions of the Bible have been launched onto the market. 
And people are more ignorant of the Bible than ever before. All you have to do is quote a verse to somebody. You could quote the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept to the average Christian, um, and he'd have no idea how to find that or what the story, the context was, the story in which that phrase is found, uh, Jesus at Lazarus' grave and so on. He would just know that the shortest verse is Jesus wept, and that's probably the only verse in the Bible he knows. You know, the JWs, they came along and they uh, changed it from two words to five words, uh, or from, yeah, and from three syllables to uh, five syllables, and they say, Jesus gave way to tears. They, they take the language of kings and they drag it through the gutter. Wept is an elegant word. I like, I like those words. Jesus wept. But uh, these modern versions think they're improving the words of God, and they're not. The idea that we have to bring the Bible down to the level of every bum on the street uh, so he can understand, that guy's not interested in it anyway. Bring him up to the level of God's book. Don't bring the Bible down to the level of uh, common man. But um, things generally, generally tend to decay and deteriorate. And uh, these men were weeping because the, the, they could remember the glory of Solomon's temple and saw this one being laid. Back in the book of First Chronicles, it says that rather than shields of gold, as David had uh, prepared for Solomon to put into the temple, they had shields of brass, which is an inferior metal. Well, uh, in fact, let's to illustrate this point. But it couldn't be told who was crying and who was shouting for joy when all of this noise was going on. Go back, if you will, to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. And here, Moses comes down from the mount um, with Joshua, and they come down from the mount uh, after God had given him the, giving him the law. Uh, begin there at Exodus 32. And verse 1, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought, up, brought, brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation, and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow, and offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Now jump down there to verse uh, 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There was a noise of war in the camp. Some were, it was hard to tell if they were singing, if they were fighting. And some sounds are not sweet uh, dulcet, charming uh, tones, and they can be mistaken for either a, a rock concert, a contemporary music, or a hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> it was hard to tell the difference. And, and the, the, the weeping of the ancient men mixed in with the shouting of the younger men was blend, blended together. It was hard to tell what was dominant when the second temple was being uh, built. 
And so it is, uh, nothing, you know, nothing evolves. The idea of uh, evolution, or the word evolve, seems to suggest automatic progress without any outside influence, without any purpose or design for it. Things simply get better on their own. And, but in observ uh, practical observation, nothing gets better on its own. If any of us leave our car sitting outside, exposed to the, the sun and the heat and the rain and the wind and everything else here in Southern California, um, eventually the, it'll fall apart, it'll, it'll rust, uh, all the rubber on the tires and the wiper blades and those things, that'll, that'll uh, rot, that'll get bad. There's a guy around the corner from us who's got a, a big trailer. It's parked on the street, and it's been sitting there so long the tires are all flat and uh, probably cracked as well. And I see a number of people who do that with their old vehicles around town. But that's what happens. Things naturally decay, they deteriorate, they corrode, they get corrupted, and uh, people tend to lose energy. That You don't get more energetic as you get older, you get slightly less energetic. And, um, and so you have to work extra hard to maintain the, some level of energy from day to day. But as a general rule, you and I tend to get a little less energetic and we're a little bit less enthusiastic about one thing or another as we were when we were younger. But uh, things don't improve on their own and usually the next generation doesn't make an improvement to something. Usually they, they do what they think is convenient for themselves. When someone says this is for your convenience, it's not for your convenience at all. It's usually for their convenience. Uh, you go to the grocery store and they've got those little rails, uh, like a little place for you to put, park all the shopping carts in there uh, at the parking lot, and the sign above says, for your convenience, park your cart in here. But if you park way over there, it's not convenient. It would be more convenient to leave the cart there. But this is to save their lot boy from having to go around and collect them all. So it's for their convenience. And... Uh, that principle seems to hold true uh, every time you see the phrase, this is for your convenience. Think it through, you'll find it's for somebody else's convenience. And you're the sucker that's being asked to do something that you would normally probably not do. Um, but things don't get better on their own, and, and the next generation thinks they're making an improvement on their parents or their grandparents' generation. When music hasn't gotten better, we think of pop popular music now. Um, Beethoven was popular music once upon a time. I would say that, that uh, popular music today isn't nearly as good as his was. Um, same thing with art. Rather than snap a quick photograph on your cell phone, and then have it blown up into a frame and say, I'm an artist. Uh, somebody used to be able to paint a scene. And so lifelike that you couldn't tell if it was real or not. But not anymore, very, very rarely anymore. And everything tends to fall apart. And, uh, the next generation thinks they're making an improvement on the last generation, and it's usually not. <laughs>